don't all countries want weak currencies? Well, it's I mean, a relative weakness. So rates. you've got to find, well, yeah, you've got to find a, a, a happy mean. Like in South Africa, we certainly don't, if you look at us specifically, we don't want to have a significantly weak currency. We don't want to be sitting at 15 because guess what? We're net importers. So that means all your food prices go up, your petrol price goes up, you get impacted on every which way. Unfortunately, where we're sitting now, our exports aren't that attractive or the, the value of them gets eroded a little bit. So it's trying to find that happy mean rather than saying weak. By saying weak, it's quite a broad statement. Okay, well, here's another follow-up to that. Uh, Paul Freidberg from uh, Durbanville says, uh, Dear Sir, Oh. Goodness gracious me. <laughs> well, last time. Now, I hate people saying sir because I just think of a headmaster and I can actually feel myself being caned. Could you please explain why the government seems to want inflation between 3 and 6%? Surely 0% inflation is preferable for the ordinary citizen to preserve their savings, and this is what should be aimed at. As a retired businessman, I can tell you any inflation is actually harmful to everyone except the government. Deficits are equivalent to printing money or, as they call it, quantitative easing. Sure. Okay, that's quite a mouthful. Um, you know what? Infl the inflation target ban in South Africa needs to be at the levels that it is because we're still an emerging market. We're still a developing nation. So you do actually need to have slightly higher inflation levels because you need that relative growth to actually make a difference in the country. And we need to start seeing that kind of sustainable growth in order to create jobs, etc. But, um, you know, you also got to be careful about how you manage that because ultimately inflation itself means that things become more expensive, which is what you, that's why that we talk about the band and we're sitting at the bottom side of that band. So relatively things are, are quite cheap. In fact, I think in all the years we've been working, it has never been as low as this. Okay. Let's go back to that 4 million Rand mm. now. Okay. Let's say Where that RMB turns money? around and says, Bridget, well done. You've been talking very well. He has 4 million Rand. One proviso. You've got to take it offshore. Okay. What currency would you buy and where would you park that money? What would you do with it? I would probably put it into, I wouldn't put it into a developed nation. I'd actually invest it into, uh, I would invest it somewhere where I would get a good return other than South Africa. Um, so I would be looking for a place that has sustainable growth and I would be looking for somewhere that has interest rates that are attractive. So that knocks out the UK, the Eurozone and the US, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. um, out of those three, if I had to pick out of those three, at the moment, I still think that the Eurozone is probably going to come out of this thing if one of the sovereigns doesn't default. They're going to be okay. I'd put it in Germany. Okay, right. Yeah. That's where I'd put my money. Not right into now. Asia. You know what? Asia's, they also very, you know, they also have, I mean, it depends about where about you're talking in Asia. I mean, if you're looking at Japan, not necessarily. Looking at um, some other Asian regions, the more emerging market Asia. Korea, I'm not sure that I know the economy well enough. Vietnam? You know, um, yeah, maybe, or Malaysia. That's maybe another one. You know, Singapore. Singapore's also a good opportunity. Are we obsessed with the dollar? Mm. Because we always seem to measure the rand in terms of the dollar. Mm. I mean, I, I think it may be one of the reasons why the JSC has launched this... Um, Yes, that currency. The, 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 RAND, the RAND index, the JC RAIN, I think they yes. call it. Yes. What, what is that all about? Is, uh, how, does, how does that work? Do you well, know? All that it really does is it means that you days. and I can become currency traders because you can actually go in and you can facilitate. You don't have to have firm and ascertainable commitments. You can actually go in and tra trade or well, participate in the currency markets. And these, there's a whole list of them. There's the yen, there's the pound, there's the euro, and there's uh, the US dollar. So, yeah, I mean, it just opens up the doors for the likes of our local investment, um, you know, houses being the asset managers as well as the hedge funds. It also means that the man in the street who, like you said earlier, might have an offshore exposure can now potentially hedge himself. Then let's look at it technically. Mm. Um, we, we say that the rand has weakened so much or strengthened so much against the dollar. If we take... They always talk about a basket of currencies. So I would presume they put in a whole range there. If we take a, a sort of traditional basket of currencies, how badly has the RAND done? The RAND's actually done, well, it's done relatively well. If you look across, um, if you look in, in terms of a basket of a whole bunch of information, being the likes of our inflation, how we've managed, you know, managed the monetary policy, what our growth forecast looks like, and also in terms of the exchange rate, we're probably one of the better performing currencies in the world close to Brazil. Brazil, in fact, till recently before they implied that Tobin tax, 
was probably one of the most favoured currencies in terms of investors. Now that Tobin tax was, for people who don't know, was... Well, sorry, when you put money into the country, they yeah. tax you on that money. So it makes it less attractive, so your return is much less. So they, they were trying like, to do that to, to stop, stop the inflows, Correct. and Correct. it worked spectacularly badly. Well, it, initially <laughs> they, they did a first round of it, um, but they did it on once the investment falls due, then you only get taxed on it. Now they've implied another tax that says when you put the money into the country, you Im immediately get taxed, which uh, immediately knocked out a whole lot of investors. So, but it you hasn't know stopped the investment. No, but it, it, stopped it, it stopped it to a degree, but is that good? That's the question that you have to ask yourself. I mean, in Brazil, they don't necessarily need as much foreign revenue as we do. We actually rely quite heavily on the surpluses that we see or the surplus that we need to, uh, and that is from foreign investors. And we actually want to see that more in terms of foreign direct investment, of which we haven't seen any this year. We've spoken about it, but we haven't seen, other than that NTT um, dimension data deal, I don't think there's been any really huge flows that we've oh, seen. There's in been lots country. of talk about yeah. things, but and nothing, things kind of, nothing's really happening. Yeah, we've got the Walmart um, mass market, mass thing. Mart. that's still in the pipeline. But, I mean, the HSBC thing's fallen by the wayside. So we really do need to see those real money flows. Are, are those the sort of deals we need done in this country? We do. And we need to, I think we need to start attracting long-term investment that ultimately can employ people, that can create opportunities for employment, build new railroads, build new ports, I don't know, create, you know, new factories. But then why aren't we getting... Because our that cost of wages is too high. I mean, if you can go and do that in China, why, why wouldn't you? Why didn't you go and do it in Vietnam? It's cheaper. In India, it's cheaper. You know, this is the concern. So you've got to be careful about how you negotiate around these types of things. You know, how do we, I mean, we were looking at the um, factory output numbers yesterday. And, um, you know, one of the big concerns is that employment is coming off. And that just means that factories are cost cutting still. And they're still finding that one of the huge revenue drains is the fact that people aren't as productive as they should be or that they can, in fact, do with less staff, which is a big concern in an environment that we're running such a huge unemployment rate. Where, where do you see, and I know this is crystal ball stuff, and you must hate being asked these questions because everyone, I mean, do you get that at dinner tables? Yeah, I do. You're like, yeah, you're in like. In the shopping centre. I know you, and yeah. I want to know where the RAND's going. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> yeah. right. I know you. Where's yeah. the RAND going? Um, 6.50, for sure. I think it's definitely going to go to 6.50. Whether we see it go much below that. Time span? Sure. Um, probably by, I would say by, by March, eh? March this next year. And... Long term, I mean, how, how far forward do you guys forecast? We forecast about a year in advance, and obviously with the markets at the moment being as unpredictable as they are because there's so many moving factors that change, like we were talking earlier about the sovereign story in the Eurozone. That's quite a big impact on South Africa because we, we trade so closely with that currency. That's an unknown. There's the likes of, um, are interest rates going to remain flat? Are there going to be inflation issues coming out of emerging markets? And that's what you're starting to see. We're starting to see a lot of people talking about hedging inflation because the likes of Australia seeing inflation. China, um, India's starting to see inflation. China's potentially got inflation. So there's what, a, and that's concerning. Hey? But now, why, what do you mean when you say hedge inflation? What do you, what do you what mean by that? What they do is that they start to say that if you're seeing inflation picking up, you're going to see interest rates pick up. That's okay. how we fight inflation is that you're going to hike interest rates. So if you are positioned a certain way and you're not sure when that's going to happen, you take out a form of cover. You can even do it on the RSA retail bond. You can buy an inflation-linked bond where it hedges you against inflation or it pays you a, a percentage based on the fact that you think that, we might, that there's an inflationary concern, which we're not in that movie right now, but that can change. But if those other countries, you mentioned Australia, for example, if, if, if we're starting to see inflation in Australia and therefore there's a good chance we're going to start seeing interest rates hiking in Australia, Correct. surely that is where investors are going to start moving money to because That's to true. me it's a very stable market and you're getting a decent interest Correct. rate now. Yeah. Will that see emerging markets, which I would imagine are by their nature a bit more volatile, mm. taking well, a bit of pain? You've got, you've got two sides of it. You've got, first of all, the interest rate there will, when you talk about a real interest rate, you're saying it's the interest rate that a country has less their inflation. So that becomes your real, that's your actual rate of return because okay. you're always going to take off your inflation from your interest rate to see what you're really getting back. Okay. So in South Africa, that's still quite attractive because you're looking at what, 7.5%, inflation sitting at 3, 4.5%, not bad. 
and it's good going. Whereas in Australia, because inflation picks up, yes, they hike interest rates. It just means your real inflation remains pretty stagnant. So you're still sitting at like one and a half percent, maybe. Or but something. what it starts to show us is that if inflation starts to become an issue, that means that there's growth happening somewhere, or it should it should be as a product of some form of growth that's happening in the country. Hopefully, that will then equate to the likes of the U.S. and the eurozone, etc., starting to up their game a little bit and then if those interest rates start moving then it will change this whole scenario that we're currently seeing so you know the global shift at the moment still looks like the outlook is very flat for a long period of time we're still expecting interest rates to remain flat in the more developed worlds for possibly the next year at least but those are the unknown factors how quickly and in south africa if the rate doesn't remain at these levels, we've got a very real inflationary concern. I mean, we've already seen the petrol price. We've been lucky that the rands remained at these levels, otherwise we would have had much more significant petrol price hikes, which impact everybody, from your guy that's catching the taxi, to you and I, to Tabo and Becky. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> I feel a bit depressed right now. <laughs> Don't feel depressed, you should be so proud to be a Southern. <laughs>